Okay, here we are with another episode of the Children's Literature Channel of the New Books Network, and I'm Mel Rosenberg, and today I'm with a splendid guest, an incredible multi-multi-multi-polymath um, author of about 90 books I can't count. Welcome to the program, Christine Taylor Butler. Thank you for inviting me. I'm really glad to be here. No, I, I, I'm really, I'm deeply honored <laughs> to have you. And um, in a few minutes, everyone is going to know why. Um, so um, let's start out with your new book that came out in August or September, if I'm not yeah. mistaken. A Corona book. Um, here's your chance. Go for it. I read it and it's wonderful. <laughs> Um, this is the get together and it is put out by Raycraft Books, which is a division of Benchmark. And mm -hmm. um, it's about a family reunion gone wrong. The original name for it was reunion because they come together in fellowship and then the competition starts over food and games and scrabble and they fall apart and then they come back together. But reunion, I think, was used. And so the publisher suggested they, they get together and so yeah, this is this is my heart, and um, the you know one of the main characters, Uncle Wesley, actually yeah. was my Uncle Wesley, and he just passed away. Oh no! This month, and so for this to come out beforehand was such a great tribute. He saw it. Uh, no, but the the relatives by then he was so sick, but I just. I know he wherever he is, he, he can see it. He what, he was like was, my what, what, father. Was he really 95? No, but close, but close. And he's in the not... book, in the book, he's 95. He's 95. He dances, he rocks, he boogies. Uh, yeah. He wins in uh, this uh, competition of being Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they played um, Twister. Yeah, you know, and Twister, Twister, yeah. Twister is a nod to his mother when I was a kid. Got us all Twister for Christmas, and we snuck up to the attic and saw them. And then because we were stupid kids, we would say, you know what we really want for Christmas? We want a twister. And my my grandmother, you know, my uncle would sit there and just laugh. And my grandma says, you've been upstairs, haven't you? And I was like, mm -hmm. so no, my 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 family members are still pretty spry. And my my um, even my husband's um, relatives, you know, his mother's still playing golf. And so his mother's playing golf. And, and how old is she? She is in her mid eighties. In in uh, you know the Jews would say bis a hundred and twenty, which means uh, may she be healthy to one hundred and twenty. Oh, thank you. I was hoping my uncle would <laughs> go till ninety five. Um, yeah, we have we have pretty good longevity in it, the family. It, 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 you have pretty long longevity. That's good. Mm -hmm. um, and he's ninety five in the book. He is. The the book is incredible. Uh, can you show a, a like a double spread? or two sure. for our um, for our video customers. Okay, so let me find one. The, those, those of you who are just listening in, uh, I, I don't want to disappoint you, but you'll just have to go and buy this beautiful book. <laughs> okay, so this is. Yeah. Yeah, Uncle yeah this is the Twister, the Twister. Play Twister. Yeah, and there's Uncle Wesley beating everybody. Yes. Um, Sorry, Christine. So uh, what what percentage of this book is autobiographical? <laughs> I'll take it. I'm pleading the fifth on that one. <laughs> <laughs> this this may it? or may <laughs> this may <laughs> or may not. I will tell you, I, I took the book with me to the funeral and, and all of my um, cousins were laughing. And I remembered there is the scene where, you know, Aunt Thelma has her brick hard fruitcake. And my mom says, don't put that in there. And my Aunt Thelma said, don't you take that out. And so when I was showing it to her son, so he was like, but my mom doesn't make fruitcake. And I said, that's the point. I said, I can kind of hack family reunions <laughs> without making it exactly the way we are. It's, it, um, it's, it's hilarious. Like one of the uncles said, just put some crumbs on your plate and she'll think we've yes. had some. Yes, it's, and I have to tell you, I what, did, did, did that really happen, or is that you made that yes, up? Yes, and I do have an aunt when I was little who used to make up words for Scrabble that no one could find in a dictionary, and just insist we were too young to understand these words. So that is why that scene's in there. Is yeah, that's not a real word. <laughs> 
I, um, but you know, the, um, the funny thing in the book, you don't see the Scrabble game, and I'm wondering if that was because uh, the publisher was afraid to put the Scrabble set in the picture. No, you know, here's, here's what happens in, in children's literature, is you write the story, and then everything goes from you and the editor to an art director and the artist. And the artist is usually given free reign to, to illustrate what they want to illustrate. So I'm not sure what direction he got. Um, there were a couple of places where the book comes back and authors don't have any, we don't get to say. But there were a couple of places like the willow tree was a regular tree. And I said, no, I, I really wanted that image. But other than that, he was he was free to play around and 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 illustrate the way he wanted to. And uh, they're wonderful illustrations. Uh, so, are you happy with them? Yeah, it's it's so it's fluid and and joyful. And and the reason why I wrote this, um, well, I've been trying to sell it for ten years. So don't give up. Um, no, only only ten years. Only ten years. But nobody understood it, and they kept saying, "What is the conflict?" And I said. Their family, <laughs> and I said yes, but there's got to be a central conflict. And I no, said, no, Christine, this is, this, is, this, this is so you know, this is so uh, you, so, so universal. Um, you know, we could do it also about a Jewish family, except the uh, <laughs> the names would be a little different. You know, Uncle Moishe, the same, yeah. uh, the same, the same shtick. It goes on I everywhere, right? I said it to Raincraft because um, I was already working with one of the editors on something else. And I said, this book, nobody understands. And I'm going to send it because you, you're starting this new imprint, Raycraft. And, and I said, but, you know, don't feel obligated to take it because no one gets why I think it's funny. And, and so it, I, I waited about a month later. I thought, eh, they're not going to take it. And she called back and said, every editor is laughing and saying, this is my family. And I said, exactly. You don't yeah. need to, be, <laughs> to have a fight. You just need to be family. Um, and then at the end, they all love each other. You know, in the end, it all comes back together because Uncle Wesley is, is, is teaching the young girl who's going to fix this when I'm gone because he's going around and untangling the, you know, the, the jump ropes. And so, yeah, my, my, uh, my real Uncle Wesley was kind of a fixer. Incredible. So uh, congratulations on this beautiful book. And I, I do you. think that because um, it is so personal, uh, that it is also universal. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's, you know, when you're able to tell your story, then everybody can empathize with it. And uh, it's, it's wonderful. I, I really recommend it to everyone who's uh, oh, watching, you. watching and listening. So uh, Christine, now's the time to spill the beans. <laughs> about your your life and craft so i know that you grew up in ohio i don't know I where did. or why i was born and raised in cleveland ohio and i was um gifted as were my sisters um my parents i always tell this story my parents don't care my parents were teenagers <laughs> They're still together. My parents were teenagers. And, and so me coming along was kind of a, a quandary. Um, and so they got married and um, my dad went to Case Western Reserve University uh, to study chemistry. And my mom was a housewife until I was about 14. Um, and so we lived with my grandparents for a very long time. So we were always, always in the library, um, always. Um, but because of that, <laughs> you know, and um, we were doing puzzles all the time and she would, you know, buy things that would come in, you know, in a package with the letters and um, we were creatively bad in school <laughs> and, you know, and, and a good example was you could not wear pants when I was in elementary school. So I organized a protest march and I created a petition and we had kids going all around the neighborhood, getting the adults to sign it. And the school board was forced to change the policy for- wow. what? Christine, where, where did you get the chutzpah? <laughs> my mom, my you're not, mom. You're, I mean, you're not Jewish, are you? I mean, Christine, uh, you know? Yeah, well, you know what? <laughs> my my where, mom- Where'd you get the chutzpah? Had, and you know, she's the only girl out of a bunch of brothers. And, and so what I didn't know was she was, you know, I was in gifted education and I was still ahead. So she was conspiring with my guidance counselor 
to get me someplace where I would be challenged, you know? And so the joke was, yeah, we had to get you out of Cleveland or you were going to end up some other place. And um, so I ended up going to boarding school in New Hampshire um, where I kind of wreaked havoc on them <laughs> the same way. Um, okay, well, I, well, I need an example. I need an example. Okay, so, so, okay, so I went to Phillips Exeter Academy in New Hampshire, which is the same school that Mark Zuckerberg has graduated from and Dan Brown and, um, and, and they like their kids um, compliant and not questioning. <laughs> and I questioned everything, you know, the rules. The, and, and what really appalled them was that my mom was always backing me up, you know, always. So anytime you went to Boston, for instance, which was a couple hours away, like she had to have a permission slip. And my mother wrote this permission slip that says, I talk to her more than you do. Um, she has my permission to do whatever she wants, whenever she wants, without. So this is a blanket permission slip. And then they thought I was this neglected child. I was like, oh, no, that was back in the day of pay phones. And, and you had to like... Um, you know, reverse the charges. I was like on the phone with my mom, <laughs> like every, she's like my best friend. And so I have to give her a plug. Um, the movie Nine to Five, you know, with Jane Fonda and Darlie Parton was based on the experiences of real women um, who were, uh, were, were having employment issues. And my mom at the time was working for an organization, Cleveland Women Working. So some of the stories in the movie nine to five were based on things my mom was doing and told Jane Fonda. So she got the Wonder Woman award the same year Cecily Tyson got it. And I think Jean Stapleton was the one to, to, to give my mom the award. But so, so I, <laughs> I am in a quietly activist family. You uh, don't brag about it. Your mom is a Wonder Woman. My mom's a Wonder Woman. That's incredible. So, I mean, how could you not be and, and supportive of you? But, you know, when I'm reading your bio, Christine, it's like um, you were hiding in the library. Mm -hmm. What were you hiding from? Uh, okay, so... so back, back in Ohio, in the early well, days. Well, you know, you're growing up in the midst of, you know, civil rights movements and things like that. Plus, I was a chunky kid and I was a nerdy kid. And, and neither, I was not athletic. You know, I didn't know, I could not name the the, the members of the Jackson Five. So I was like a, a social outcast because I'm in a house where I'm listening to classical music. And, um, but, but you could be someone else in a book, you know? And I, I had the same thing, you know, you had to have permission from your parent to check out books from the adult section, you know, instead of the little kid section. And you know, my mom said, she can check out any book she wants. <laughs> As I see them, you know, she's gonna hide them. Um, so, so I grew up surrounded by parents who read and 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 value books, and and I grew up reading because there are just days when you want to be someplace else or someone else and imagine a world that's more than what the world tells you you are entitled to have. Um, wow! So you, I, you I live your 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 mom is a Wonder Woman. Mm -hmm. um, are you a mommy's girl or a daddy's girl because you didn't say anything about your father? Okay, so I'm a daddy's girl now. Um, I was not athletic growing up, so it's kind of a disappointment, but all my like tinkering <laughs> and, you know, like I, I'm rehabbing an old hundred year old house um, comes from my dad's side. <laughs> Uh, but my dad was very traditional, you know, and just very, you know, there are rules. And my mom's like, yeah, there are rules. But, you know, sometimes there's not a front door. You have to go around the back door. And 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 so sometimes we we're at odds. But my dad and I, you know, we just laugh on the phone. And, yeah, he's like one of my best friends. So you, you've grown into this uh, adult relationship. Yeah, when I said I was having children, he laughed. And I didn't understand why until I started raising my children. I was like, okay, you got me. I was a bad kid. <laughs> he had some trouble raising you within, <laughs> within, within the rules of society. True. But, you know, bad kids turn out to be really activist, good people. So. Yeah, well, how, how, yeah. How old were you when you did the uh, I'll wear pants thing? Oh, God, that was elementary school. So we were talking <laughs> probably about fourth grade. And I, it was explained to me, I did my petition wrong because you need the statement on every page. And I had just taken a clipboard and put 
lots of blank paper on. So people were signing a petition, but not on a page that said what it was. And, you know, but the city was embarrassed. So, you know, <laughs> so we sat all protesting. So, so you went to a boarding school. So like as a teenager, you were out of town. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, uh, I exited at 14. Incredible. And, um, and then the, you studied engineering at university. I did. Yeah. Civic engineering, like my late father. Mm -hmm. Where did you study engineering at MIT? MIT. So yeah. you, 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 did, you didn't pick a shabby place to study engineering. No, my eighth grade teacher who was encouraging me to do the boarding school thing, which, you know, I didn't, I didn't know anything about boarding schools other than the movie, The Trouble with Angels. So I was like, mm, that didn't sound like me. And, and, and he encouraged me to do it. And then he said, when you, when you do that, you're really good at math and you like puzzles and you do all the extra credit stuff. Um, you should look at a school, MIT. Well, nobody talked about MIT in Cleveland. So M means Michigan. You know, everybody knows <laughs> go up to the next state is Michigan. And it wasn't until I got to Exeter and here are all these international kids and they're talking in a language we didn't have in our neighborhood. You know, they're talking about Harvard and Yale and MIT and Stanford. And I'm like, um, and, and what really propelled me was I had um, a guidance counselor. I was doing really well. I was on the Dean's list um, who said MIT was not for me and I wasn't gonna get in. And, you know, I grew up in a family that loves a challenge. And uh, he says, what's your backup plan? And I said, Cornell has a really good <laughs> architecture program. And he says, no. So he told me um, to do Ball State and Denison and Ohio State. And I said, I'm from Ohio. Didn't Ohio State have to take everyone from Ohio? And, and those were my three choices. And, and, and I was really angry about that. So I applied to MIT, Cornell, and Ohio State and, and got into all three. And, and ended up going to MIT, which of the schools is, is, was really flexible and realized I wasn't happy as an engineer, so allowed me to have two advisors and work on two degrees at the same time. And so they would coordinate which classes would count for both degrees. So that's why I have one degree in art and design and one degree in, in civil engineering. Yes, so you've called yourself <clears throat> the ultimate oxymoron in having both these hats, mm -hmm. but, but I mean, I, I'm happy to find that the, there are kindred spirits, yeah. but I, as somebody who's a scientist and a writer and a musician, I don't, I don't see the distinction. No, they're all, they're all creative pursuits. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, they all in, uh, they all involve many of the same ways of thinking, don't they? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I am right brain, left brain. And when the kids were growing up, um, unfortunately they had me for a mom. Um, when I was growing up, my parents dragged an old piano home that somebody gave them for free. And we had to teach ourselves because there was no get piano lesson money in our budget. But I did, <laughs> I did play violin through my elementary school because the Cleveland Symphony had people who would teach you during the week, you know, you take the bus downtown. So when I had kids, um, I realized people don't get art and music are also sciences and music is a code. You know, music is a mathematical code with, with rhythms. And, and so what we did was we had both of our kids take piano lessons and then my youngest went on to flute. But I said, what's interesting about piano is you have to read two lines of music simultaneously while manipulating your left and right hand. Um, so I said, it's a puzzle, you know, and everybody thinks of it as just, it's this, this intuitive thing. And I'm like, no, it, it, there's a science behind it. And whether they went on to be musicians was not what I cared about. It was exercising both the right and left sides of their brains. Absolutely. And um, I think that I was able to maneuver my life because I'm left-handed. Mm -hmm. And learning to play piano is even more of a maneuver. So is my husband, who's left-handed and plays piano. Oh, I, I, I'd love to meet him. What does he do? He's a family doc. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love doctors. Yeah, he's like Marcus Welby. Does, does he write children's books? He has written one. 
um, for Scholastic a long time ago. But okay, that, that's enough. We can. <laughs> we have to persuade him to write another, and then he can be on the show. Oh, there you go. Okay. And and so uh, before we move on with after with after college, mm -hmm. um, the, I, I have this theory, Christine. I'm not a psychologist, but I believe that those of us who write for children are stuck somewhere at the same age that we write for. So like I write for five-year-olds and I know that I'm writing for me. Did you connect with that somehow? Do I have to admit that? Cause the answer is yes, but <laughs> now it's on, now it's on, yeah. You know, um, I have always, I've always wanted to write cause I'm a big sci-fi person. And you know, and I grew up reading those kinds of anthologies and stuff. And I always wanted to write for that, that in between group, you know, not, not, not YA where, you know, there's a different kind of angst. And I, you know, most of my books are for little kids and I actually have a science fiction book coming out at Benchmark next year um, for little kids set on a different planet. But I, you know, I wanted to write something, I would call it in the Harry Potter space, but with science. And so I wrote, um, just take these out. Yes. The and it, started, it started out being a picture book about kids who suspect their parents are a little off. And, and, and I showed it to an editor at Random House and they said, you know, this should be a novel. And I thought, I don't know anything about a novel. So, you know, one day I got this idea based on my family about a kid who wants the approval of an uncle and the uncle's <laughs> never going to approve of them. And it's not Uncle Wesley. I actually have another uncle who just nothing I did pleased him. And finally, someone said he was the baby of the family. It was my uncle Billy. He was the baby of the family until you came along and then he wasn't special anymore. And I was like, but he's a grown man. How can this be? And, and so I had this kernel of idea and it wouldn't stay in one book. So now it will be four. There's three out. And what I realized is I really relate to those kids. So I'm probably stuck in middle grade. You know, something about getting to Exeter stunted my growth right there. Mm -hmm. Stopped so it, I, I, it, it, it's, a, it's a great way to, uh, you know, this is a therapy of uh, the communication with the lost child inside us. Yeah, you know, they're not babies anymore, but they're not grownups. And, and, but, but, you know, when you have really, really smart kids, but their prefrontal cortex is not fully developed, I had to think about how did I make decisions at that age? Mm -hmm. And 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 it's hilarious how clueless I was. You know, you'd have a sky high IQ, and you just go, "Oh, mm, yeah." So um, now, now that you've agreed with me, um, <laughs> so what happened after college? Did you become an engineer or an arts and design person? Um, I was bouncing around trying to figure out my destiny. So I worked for worked for MIT for a while. And then I worked for um, Filene's Basement, was, which was my favorite place to shop. So I worked in the corporate office. That's um, where we met. That's where we met. Yeah. Filene's Basement. I lived in Filene's Basement. I got my wedding dress from Filene's Basement. Um, and, 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 but I was, um, I was not enamored with some of the internal politics. And so I quit and ended up working for Harvard University in the development office. Um, and by then I had met the man of my dreams and he was graduating from Boston University. And I love New England. I'd been there since I was 14. And, and, and he, he also an Ohio boy um, and really wanted to move back to the Midwest. And so he got assigned to Kansas City and we ended up staying because the cost of living here is, you know, and then we're in the middle, so we can get to California and get to Boston, you know, pretty quick on a plane. So yeah, we've been here since. I might take a plane. I might take a train. It's there right from go. the Kansas City song. <laughs> it is. I'm going Everyone, to Kansas City. Everybody Kansas is Harvard City, was singing that song, and I was like, I don't know that. So how can you move to Kansas City and not? I now know that song, yes. Mm -hmm. I, and I'm not, I'm not that far from the jazz district. Yeah, and if I'm not mistaken, I think that that song was written by two Jewish boys <laughs> who fell in love <laughs> with jazz. 
Uh, and uh, yeah. so that's a, that's a, a tremendous connection. And mm -hmm. um, okay, so and you've you've written only about ninety books. Only, um, yeah, yeah. So, so, only, yeah. and I have um, one, two, three, four more coming out. <laughs> so um, you have an agent. Mm -hmm. You work directly with publishers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tell, I, tell I, us. I, I, I tried agents twice, and um, if, if I can find the right agent, I'm happy to turn that part over. But I, I have not written a query letter in 15 years. Um, even I have a three book deal with Random House. It's under um, a confidentiality agreement. They called me. So um, I haven't had to need an agent, but I'm not adverse to it. How lucky I am to interview somebody like you. You certainly well, don't do you, don't, you certainly don't do things the right way, you know. No, I don't. I you know, I, you know, when you have an agent, yeah, you you give up 15% of your income. Yeah. And so if the right agent can negotiate, you know, like really good stuff in a movie deal, you know, I'm happy to consider <laughs> that. Um but um I'm a member of the Authors Guild. And um, they have really good lawyers. So if I have concerns about a contract, I'm really good at reading contracts now. I can send it to them and say, yeah, what do you think about this? Incredible. So, um, so how did you break into publishing? It's so difficult. You're like really, really hard. A, one in a hundred thousand writers have the kind of careers that you have. It's really hard. And, and I tell people, don't quit your day job to do this first, which <laughs> I did, which is the wrong quit, way to do it. Don't quit Filene's basement, folks. <laughs> Just, I, you know. Uh, so, so um, you know, I had been um, an MIT interviewer in the evenings. And, and, and I saw this shift. You know, you see these kids are reading all the time. And then all of a sudden, at least in the United States, and there's this emphasis on a test score and having the perfect resume. And, and so they would walk into my interviews. And at the same time, my husband was interviewing for a UMKC, University of Missouri at Kansas City's med school. And, and, and so he says, oh, I've got some questions I'll share with you and you can try them. So you'd meet these kids and you'd say, okay, so if you were a superhero, which one would you be and why? And you would watch certain subsets of kids just melt down. You can't ask me that question. My mom did say, you know, I got coached at school. And here are the <laughs> questions you're allowed to ask. I could sit in a coffee shop just laughing because they couldn't get off the script. But the kids who were reading, oh, I would be this, but I'd have my own name and I'd be invisible because I could do that. And those were the kids I was writing up, um, you know, in a good way. And what I realized is I started you know, probing the kids who weren't reading and it was because they didn't have time or you couldn't read a book if it didn't have an accelerated reader um, score attached to it that the schools could use. And, and I got to thinking, here I am working at Hallmark Cards. I've been there for 11 years and I'm in the engineering department and the applied engineering. So we're taking all the new technology and making sure the printers can do it correctly and and, but I but I also have the art and design degree. So I was a person who was explaining to the art departments, this is why we can't recreate what you just did. You know, we're limited in the colors we can put on a printing press. And, um, and I was a little envious about their living their dreams. <laughs> but, you know, engineering paid more. Um, and then one day <laughs> I just said, you know, Hallmark is privately owned, still is. Um, and I said, you know, I, you know, I told one of the, the owners who I was friends with, I said, um, I don't want my headstone to say, you know, best darn Hallmark employee ever. I, I wanna show my kids how to make their dreams come true. And that means taking this non-traditional path. And, you know, he sent an email saying I left Hallmark better than I found it, which, you know, I, I really appreciated. Um, so I did this thing and it wasn't as easy as it looked. It wasn't just getting the book and then you send your stuff to every publisher. <laughs> like it just didn't work that way. And, and then one day I met um, Kent Brown, whose family, his grandparents started Highlights for Children. Yeah. And they had been doing um, Highlights Foundation, which is their nonprofit arm, had been doing these courses. 
And he was at a conference and he said, you should come out to Chautauqua. This is after I turned him down you know, about sending word. And he says, we spend a week in upstate New York and you get mentors and trainers and it's a week of learning how to write your craft and, and, and how to develop yourself as an author. And I did that. And probably a week or two later, one of the editors um, emailed me and said, hey, do you feel like writing? Would you like to write early readers? And I said, I don't know how to do those. And she says, yes, but I'm a darn good editor. Pitch me some ideas. And she bought um, No Boys Allowed. It's my very first book. It published in 2003. So three years after I quit Hallmark. So that people understand this timeline. And um, A Mom Like No Other, which was a rhyming book about a girl who's very um, opposite of her mother. And No Boys Allowed went on to sell about 100,000 copies. Wow. Because I was writing about a boy who was odd man out. And someone said, where did you get that idea? And I said, I have two girls and my um, uh, middle sister has two girls and my youngest sister at the time had one girl, one boy. Mm -hmm. And I said, so we get family unions together. We're all in different states. And he's always the odd man out you know, who want to do sports, they want to play Barbies or, um, and so I kind of tried to write this book about a boy who wanted to enter a jump rope contest, but the girls won't play with him or won't let him train. And, and it was really resonating with people. So it, it did really well. And that book, um, and mom, like no other kind of launched my career. Incredible. But what you didn't say, how did you meet Kent Brown? You didn't walk I by him in the Kent street. Brown. I was at I was at a conference and because airfares, <laughs> you know, I, I was like on this little budget, I would always go when the airfares were cheapest. And so I would always end up at these conferences in the morning and I don't like to be bored. So I would go down to the ballrooms and say, do you need help? And I, you know, I take banners and set up tables and they're like, yeah, but you're an attendee. I was like, you know, yeah, but I don't want to be bored. So and this was a conference for writers? It's a conference for children's writers. And mm -hmm. then at the end, they said, we are all going to dinner and you might as well be part of the conference team because you did so much work. What's it, Christine? Um, so this is, this is before you were published? Before I was published. And I was sitting across. And the this table. was after, after Hallmark. So after Hallmark. After Hallmark. You said, I want to write for kids. I'll yeah. go to a conference. So this would have been, I want to say 2001, maybe about a year after I left Hallmark. And, and I was sitting across from Kent Brown and I had heard him speak. And, and that's when we, you know, we got to talking and, and I learned real quick, don't be the person who's always talking about your books, you know, be interesting. And, and finally he said, you know, why don't you send me some stuff? And that's when I said, I don't think I've written anything worthy of you yet because I'm still brand spanking new. And then his secretary called and said, Kent would like you to attend the Chautauqua conference in upstate New York and we'll give you a scholarship. So, well, you know, I, I, I'm not, I'm not surprised. So, you're but yeah, a, but that's where you're, you're such a sparkling human being. And, and um, just the idea, you know, I have a friend who wa wanders around the world showing up early for conferences and and this is what he teaches mm -hmm. is always come early listen you know i um wow i i i have to tell you a story now i, I went to okay. a, a, a conference in the states and not a scientific one a conference for kind of un unconventional thinking people and um and i showed up early and i helped with the banners and everything Mm -hmm. And um, one of the incredible people that I met at that conference was Jimmy Wales, who is also my hero. You know, he's a guy who who did uh, Wikipedia. So um, this really resonates, um, showing up early and helping mm -hmm. with the banners. Uh, what other advice do you have for uh, people who are listening who want to succeed as children book writers? Um, what, what pearls of wisdom can you share? Okay, one, um, okay, I used, to, I used to be head of Missouri Writers Guild and so we would do these conferences and I would watch who agents and editors would gravitate to and there were people who were interesting. They might have a flawed manuscript, 
but there were people who were, I mean, you don't have to be outgoing, but um, people were down to earth who looked like they would be open to change and, and critique. They weren't constantly talking about their writing or trying to say, you know, I got this manuscript and you might want to look at it. Um, Second, everything you write isn't going to be wonderful. I had to learn that the hard way. Um, but one of my favorite editors said, I can edit what's there. I can't edit what's not there. So I tell people, have multiple sloppy, rough drafts before you send one, because you're still learning about your story. And it's not till you get to the end of the story that you realize, oh, this is what I was planning to do. Now let me go start over and, and, and make it right. Um, Support other people in the industry. I, you know, I, I, I write a lot and my husband and I joke, we go out now and they say, what do you do? And he goes, I work in a hospital. And people think he's northerly. And I say, what do you do? And I was like, ah, I just, I write children's books. And then they think I'm self-published. You know, I, I was on a radio <laughs> show and somebody says, how many books have you written? I said, oh, about 80. And the guy says, 80. No, how many have been published? And I said, about 80. I think I've written about 150 that are not, and he hung up. And, and, and so what I realized is when people figure out, no, I'm really serious. I, I actually have to pay a mortgage on, <laughs> on my work. Um, I get all kinds of strangers who will say, would you read my book? Would you give me a blurb? Um, would you mentor me? I, I, I've gotten people who have out of the blue, hey, we went to the same college, maybe 10 years apart. Would you mentor me? And, and, and one, I don't have the time because I realize a lot of times people want to compliment. They don't want to hear what's working and what's not working. But, but the second is, I always go, which one of my books have you bought? So, so what I try to do is I quietly try to support those authors who are out there not only working really hard, but they're out there buying other people's books and they're out there you know, raising the bandwidth of people who are still struggling um, and pay it for it. I always say, you don't have to pay me back, pay it forward, because that's what happened to me when I met Kent Brown and the Highlights Group was um, they said, we're going to help you get unstuck, pay it forward. So it's about Incredible. skill. It's like Incredible. piano. You can't, you know, I, I went after my local newspaper for doing an article about local authors who are self-published and one says, yeah, I wrote my children's book on the plane to China. And, and, and I wrote the editorial director, they had to change the article. And I said, you really dishonor the people who do this for a living because that's what people think it is, is that this picture book happened in an hour. And I can show you the picture book that took 25 revisions because the editor and I were not on the same page. I said, it's hard work, but it is the best job I've ever had. I, I think I have manuscripts who have gone through, which have gone through 50 or 100. Mm -hmm. So I guess mm -hmm. that's really the best advice. If you think you're going to write something and uh, you know, have it uh, really ready, <laughs> forget it. It takes years. And I will tell you one other thing. I got this advice from Jane Yolen, which was, you know, if you get a rejection, sometimes it's not that it's not a good manuscript. It's the wrong editor, the wrong publisher. So this is why I tell people 10 years of rejections, not because there was something wrong. It's because those editors didn't get it and you'd end up with a different book. 10 years of rejections. Yeah the best publishing house and, and, and editor I've ever worked with. Um, Wonderful. Like this. So the lost tribes, let, let's go back to the get together. Mm -hmm. A few words, a few words about the, uh, the uh, wonderful illustrator. Lonnie Olivieri. I think that's how you pronounce it. I should ask him. Um, mm -hmm. I think this is his first book. And, and what's funny about it is, um, like I said, we don't get, we don't get to tell the person, let me see if I can find it. We don't get to tell the illustrator what to illustrate. Um, there is a scene that I make kind of the litmus test for this book, which of mm -hmm. course, now that I'm looking for it, I can't find it. Um, one of the reasons why it's so important to have culture in a publishing house, not people, who, you know, they really want to bring in more people of color. You have to understand what we're doing. And this said everything to me. One, I'm sorry, 
black families run behind. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can say that. Um, but I wrote, the aroma of sizzling chicken and frying hair float from the kitchen. Aunt Audrey always uses too much grease on both. This is the first publisher that understood that, you know, the reunion is starting, they're still cooking, but someone's getting their hair done with a hot comb on the stove. And even the white editor at this particular house, Wiley Blevins said, you know, I, I made this joke about burnt ears and he says, I went to a predominantly black school and the girls always had burnt ears because their mothers wouldn't let them come to school without their hair being pressed. So you have that comb heated up on the stove, you've got grease in your hair and it's sizzling, you get too, <laughs> too close to the edges of your ears, it's gonna singe. And he said, I knew exactly what you were talking about. And they didn't have to explain it to the illustrator. He knew exactly. I mean, I say the aroma of frying hair, knew exactly what that meant. And so that has been an issue for authors of color. And I have a lot of clout now. <laughs> I can just say, I'm not doing that, or you can have the contract back. But there are a lot of authors and illustrators who cannot turn down a contract or don't have enough love to be able to negotiate so the biggest problem that we've seen in the past is books that start out culturally relevant but are not about civil rights and slavery that suddenly sound like somebody from Brooklyn, New York. You know, um, I'm sorry, the, the only way to say this is, is a white middle-class woman from Brooklyn, New York. And, and, I'm, and I'm at a retreat where I say that to editors is at some point you have to respect that I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. I have a cousin who's a well-known jazz musician who grew up in California. We're both in the same family. We had completely different experiences and yet there are certain rhythms and commonalities that you have to let stay in the book so that the kids we're trying to reach will see themselves and hear themselves, but that other kids will read about their rhythms separate from it's always 12 years a slave and it's always Martin Luther King, so. There you are. I'm opinionated. No, I I think so. So here, this is the this is the the uh, oxymoron, and this is going to be my last question because we can run on forever, I think. Um, and uh, I hope that next week we can take this uh, off camera and continue because there's so many things that we can talk about. So <laughs> the 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 the, um, the irony here is that on the one hand, you know, look, um, most agents are not Afro-Americans, and most publishers are not Afro-Americans, and most publishers are not Jewish, and most publishers and editors and agents are not guys. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I, I think that I've interviewed among the 35 people, maybe one or two writers who are not women. And I go to a conference, I'm practically the only guy, right? Not, not to talk about being bald and Jewish and left-handed. Um, mm -hmm. So everybody says, you know, we need diverse voices. We need the left-handed people and we need the Afro-American people and we need Puerto Rican people and Hispanics and, and people from all over the place and people who are different, but <laughs> we're, we're gonna run with the same, uh, you know, the same uh, female-written uh, Brooklyn, uh, Brooklyn type middle-class whatever. It's, it's natural for people to, you know, they're looking for their preferences. You know, I'm, 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 I, I have had several interesting, difficult edits on books this past year because the editors were adding things. One, when I'm, especially when I'm writing nonfiction, it's got to be correct. <laughs> you can think it's cute, but it's, you know, I'm going to get, I'm going to get tagged on it if it's not correct. But also it's not my voice, you know, and, and, and part of diversity is not so that you have a figurehead on the front of that book. Um, I think after about you know, 80, 90 books, I, I have a kind of good bead on, on kids and teachers and libraries. I'm in, I'm in those venues all the time. And I said, children's publishing, you know, everybody's focused on ALA and, and what does Publishers Weekly want? And, and those are great because it's a great way to get the word out about a book. But publishing, you know, at Hallmark, we had focus groups and a lot of, companies, there are focus groups. And, and, and publishing is the only place I've ever seen as a business where the focus group are gatekeepers who in many cases are like them. And, and, and they're not talking to kids and they're not talking to parents. And they're not always respecting someone like me. It's like, you know what, I raised kids 
And somebody will say, oh, do kids really say that? Or do kids really do that? And at one point someone said, you know, in, in my science fiction series, these don't seem like normal African-Americans. And I said, well, what is normal? I said, well, the dad drives a Mercedes. And I said, oh yeah, that car is horrible. It's horrible. He says, how do you know that? And I said, when I blew the car up in the book, it's because my car was always breaking down. Yeah, I had a first model year SUV and that's horrible. And I said, and, and she said, well, you're not, you're not normal, you know, because you grew up <laughs> in the suburbs. And I said, I grew up in the hood in Cleveland, the two teenage parents, where do you get these images from? And, and I think that's, uh, you know, or you get a book and it's, it's, it's illustrated as if you live in a brownstone in Brooklyn. And I go, you know, we have to open up the landscape that people live in small houses and big houses and neighborhoods. And, you know, I rode a unicycle when I was a kid. I couldn't play basketball, much to the consternation of my dad. Um, so so, so here, here's what I want to leave you with. Um, um, last year, or maybe two years ago, when George Floyd died, um, there was this flood of people, especially teachers and librarians, coming on social media and saying, um, could you recommend a book about racism or anti-racism? And I go, oh my God, we do this every, every February and it has not changed anything. So my husband is, you know, he's a black belt in multiple styles. So he's my Zen master. And he says, don't, don't, <laughs> don't say what you know you want, you, you're going to say, you know, wait a minute. And, and I thought about it and then I wrote a tweet, you know, you're, you're, you're limited on how much you can put in a tweet. And I said, you know what, I'm a mother and I'm a former college interviewer and, and I'm a children's author and you need to hear me. Um, for every book about racism and civil rights, you better give that kid 20 books about joy because they need to see themselves in normal situations where they're just kids and other kids need to see them as kids that's how you defeat racism is you let the world see us as human. That tweet got 500,000 views and 2,400 retweets in the first week. I ended up in the New York Times and CBS, Boston's local affiliate and, and blogs. And people were saying, thank you for giving me the permission to do something else. I said, they see that oppression every day on the news. Where are the books where they can laugh and just say, oh, yes, my uncle cheats at cards, you know, or, you know, they're, they're, <laughs> what do you do to unpack all that stress? You need to laugh and you need to be joyful and you need to know, you know what, I failed at this and I'm going to pick myself up and keep going. You do this every February as you trot out the 1,000th iteration of Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks. And even those books are not completely true. You know, Claudette Colvin is the person who didn't get off the bus and was on the Supreme Court case. So, so you know, don't do what is easy. Do what is not easy and try to find those books because also those authors have a very hard time convincing publishers to pick them up because it's not about civil rights or slavery. And they're like, well, anybody read this? Yes, it should be you. You should be you saying this book made me laugh or this kid I had in my classroom resonated because he's in a blended family and he read No Boys Allowed and he felt like this book is about me. So that that's me. So this has been great, Christine uh, Taylor Butler. Um, <laughs> I, I'm really, I'm, I'm deeply honored. Really, I am. And um, I hope you continue with this wonderful uh, maverick uh, work of yours. And I can tell you as a, as a Jewish bald guy, <coughs> uh, hang uh, show, show us your book again, um, before because we have to go. Uh, this book, uh, The Get Together, um, I, I laughed my, 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 <laughs> I said, this is just, just like so much like our family get togethers when I was a kid. I mean, not, not in any, the food is different and the hair thing is different, uh, but we did play Scrabble and um, it, it's just, it just touches your heart. Yeah. So, so re everybody run out and get this book. And, Thank uh, you. and I hope that we will continue this wonderful uh, uh, camaraderie um, and, uh, and 
bless you for joining us with all of your wisdom and talent. You are welcome. And I know I mentioned Wiley Blevins, but I have to give a shout out to Eileen Robinson, who has been one of my editors for 20 years. And she is the one that took this book into Ray Craft and said everyone laughed. And so, yeah, thank you, Eileen. I really appreciate you. It's hilarious. So thank you very much, Christine. Uh, I'm Mel Rosenberg for NBN, uh, Children's Literature Channel, and it's been wonderful. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Bye. Bye.